So before we jump in, um, I wanna start by just sharing that one of Wendy's goals for um, kids who come into Kids Space this year and next year all the exhibition is on view and for visitors in general is to understand that Native Americans are not a monolithic community, that there are many, many, many different cultures. Um, so she is particularly speaking from an Absalica perspective, uh, but part of her goal is for people wherever they might be to sort of look into the indigenous stewards of the land that they're living on. So to that end, I'm gonna start us off with a land acknowledgement for this part of Western Mass where I'm calling in from in North Adams and where Mo Mass Mocha is located. Um, so it is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we are gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, the people of the waters that are never still, who are the indigenous people of this land. Despite tremendous hardship and being forced from here, Today, their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So thank you, and Laura, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the meditation. Great. Well, I know you can't see it, but for the first time in eight months, I put on lipstick. And so I'm very excited about this. But I'm also really excited. There's people here. Lee's here. Amanda Potter. Oh my God. You probably haven't seen me with my hair this color. Anyway, it's very exciting to see you all here and with us. And um, like Amanda said, Amanda Tobin, my other Amanda in my life, um, said, we um, have developed this over the course of, I guess, the past uh, five or six, no seven, eight years now, uh, this pedagogy that we call Art Insight. And the mindfulness practice is really, um, you'll see, makes a, a connection to um, the artist and um, their process. Um, so, and also the content. So I'm gonna do, uh, lead you in a guided visualization using a story that uh, the great Thich Nhat Hanh has written. Um, so, if you are comfortable with closing your eyes during this, that's great. If you don't have an experience with doing a mindful practice, that's fine too. Basically, the idea is uh, just to realize that you can't shut off all the stuff that's going on in your head. It's, it's always going to be there. It's part of our human nature. It's kind of like breathing in and out. Um, and rather say, okay, recognize when you are are getting distracted thoughts like oh my cat is curling up on my leg or i want to go have dinner or when's the next part of this try to just gently say to yourself okay that's for later um and come back to the intention of being with this practice so um doing a guided meditation like this is kind of like story time for your mind so um, I'm going to try to uh, detail a story that will encourage you to pay attention to your inner world, your imagination, and your thoughts and breathing. So uh, like I said, you know, we use this with our, our school groups, this model, but it has this relates to, how does this relate to Wendy? Um, so she grew up, like uh, Amanda said, she grew up on the Crow Reservation in Montana. And from her childhood, Wendy's been very much interested in learning about her ancestors and her relatives. And just like Wendy, we are connected to generations of people. And we too are connected to people in the past, the present, and the future. So this guided meditation is going to give you, hopefully, a realization that we as human beings are all interconnected. As people who live among animals, plants, other natural materials, we are all connected in some way. So let's begin by having you take a posture in your chair and just notice yourself sitting there. Put your feet straight on the floor if you're sitting in a chair. If you're sitting on a bed or something like that, just you know, try to get as comfortable as you can but sitting as up as uh, straight as you can. And make any adjustments that you might need 
Now I'd like to invite you to close your eyes. And if you don't feel comfortable closing your eyes, just um, gently put them in front of you and uh, not too far up. And let's just take a few deep breaths in and out. So we'll do inhale. Exhale. And inhale. And exhale. Notice as you're breathing with your eyes closed, how the breath goes in and as it feels, as it's touching the inside of your nostrils, going down into your lungs, filling your belly, and then coming out again. Notice how your body moves, your belly is rising and it's falling. You might even put your hand on your belly to feel your breath going in and out. And if you have headphones, this is really a cool thing. Just listen to your own breathing in and out. The sensation of the breath going in and out, the sound of the breath as if it's like an ocean going in and out. And remember, if your mind starts to wander, just bring it back. Gently say to yourself, oh, that's just me thinking. I'll do that later. Now, try to keep your eyes closed for this part. And I'd like for you to imagine the elements of this story in your mind's eye. This is again by Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a Buddhist peace leader and a poet. One autumn day, I was in a park, absorbed in the contemplation of a very small, beautiful leaf shaped like a heart. Its color was almost red, and it was barely hanging on the branch, nearly ready to fall down. I spent a long time with it, and I asked the leaf a number of questions. I found out the leaf had been a mother to the tree. Usually, when we think there that the tree is the mother and the leaves are just children. But as I looked at the leaf, I saw the leaf is also a mother to the tree. The sap that the roots take up is only water and minerals, not su sufficient to nourish the tree. So the tree distributes that sap to the leaves and the leaves transform the rough sap into elaborated sap. And with the help of the sun and gases, sends it back to the tree for nourishment. Therefore, the leaves are also the mother to the tree. Since the leaf is linked to the tree by the stem, the communication between them is easy to see. We have a great many stems linking us to our mother earth. There are stems linking us with the clouds. If there are no clouds, there'll be no water for us to drink. We are made up of at least 75% water and the stem between the cloud and us is really there. This is also the case with the river, the forest, the auger, and the farmer. There are hundreds of thousands of stems linking us to everything in the cosmos, supporting us and making it possible for us to be. Do you see the link between you and me? If you are not there, I am not here. So next time you go for a walk, take a moment to look at the leaves on a tree or some other item in nature. Consider all the things that go into keeping that item alive. How is it connected to the past? What will happen to it in the future? When you look at Wendy's artwork about Crow or Absalica leaders from the late 1800s, Think about how she's connected to their lives, even though she didn't know them. How are you connected to people you don't know? 
How are you connected to your ancestors? Now let's take a deep breath in and out to conclude this session. You can open your eyes and take notice how you're feeling right now. Perhaps a little bit more peaceful, aware of your connection to others. Maybe this is a great starting point for when you're thinking about doing anti-racist work that you have to recognize that we're all connected in some way, that we're not these individual trees, that we're all support systems for each other. And I know that sounds groovy, crunchy granola, but in my heart, that's what I believe, that we should all walk around this earth with that intentionality that we're all in this together. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. All right, so um, we are gonna spend the next half an hour in conversation about this piece. I just started sharing my screen, can everyone see? Yeah, okay. So I am going to do my best to keep track of um, the chat boxes to see when you're raising your hand, but um, also uh, just feel free to unmute yourself and chime in and we'll, we'll do it as gracefully as possible as uh, Zoom allows. <laughs> so um, just take a moment and um, look at this work. And um, I just would like to invite any initial responses or things that people are wondering or curious about when they're looking at this. So Katie in the chat says a diorama. Yes. Um, what about it, Katie? Can you elaborate? <clears throat> what about it looks like a diorama to you? The flat background, the deer. Okay, what are other people noticing about this? A living body in a two dimensional world. Yes, thank you, Stephanie. Go ahead. I just heard someone's voice. Go ahead. Oh, I was, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, this is Tim Hartel. Um, I was just noticing the, really intrigued by the, the white um, skull that looks like it's made out of plastic. It just seems very different than the, um, the other um, animals and people that are more um, like figurative. It's like a, it looks just sort of cartoonish in a way that's, I don't know, similar but also different than the um, like the uh, deer and the woman sitting down and the rabbit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thanks, Tim. And there's a lot of comments in the chat about the things that feel real and artificial that are juxtaposed. So, and Tim's even noticing that the, the deer is one level of artificial, but the skull, the white skull in the foreground feels like a different level, more, even more fake. Um, Carrie's noticing that the figure is posed very carefully. Um, it looks unnatural, very staged, and we have this Midwestern or Western landscape. Anybody else wanna unmute themselves and share something? I think I saw in the chat, Chalice mentioned the tape on the back of the deer or what could be tape. Um, and I think connecting to that, what I find like what brings me the most humor in this piece is like the what I interpret as lines of like folding or assemblage that's on the deer and then the backdrop um, of the mountains. Yeah, thank you, Molly and Chalice. So noticing that the like the fake elements look like they could be folded up like this is almost portable. You could move it from place to place. Yeah, this is Sierra. Um, 
Yeah, at first glance, the image is very striking and beautiful and you notice all of the all of the colors and how they coordinate and coincide with each other. And then upon further inspection, you notice all of these, all of these little things like the tape or the folding. And it's, it, it's really interesting how it makes you pay attention to the details and notice what's actually going on. Yeah, you thank you. Look. Did other people have a similar experience of an initial impression of it that then uh, when you spent more time, you realize it's not all quite what you thought it was. Some nods. Um, I don't think I find. Oh. No, go ahead. Yeah. One thing I find is that I can't quite place the time period because I can't tell if it's um, if it's made now, like trying to be retro, or it's an old photo, and then with the different textiles between the paper and the plastic. I can't quite put my finger on the time period is too. So I find that interesting as well. Yeah, thanks, Megan. And so, yeah, the, I think that goes back to the idea of a diorama, which we'll, we'll circle back to, and this is a definite through line, but the idea of um, not being able to place what time it is or being sort of timeless. You have the backdrop, which Wendy said she, you know, just got off eBay or something from, um, it's a vintage 70s backdrop. Um, but then you have these newer plastic elements and also her, her clothing, which we aren't sure what, where to place that necessarily. Yeah, and Chris says, when is it? So she took the photo in 2006. So not too long ago. Um, some other comments from the chat that there, it reads like a dreamscape, a collaged earth culture or a pop-up book. And the glare on the background messes with depth or the sense of depth as well. Um, people are noticing the colors. Uh, the blue dots on the right hand, are they part of the artwork or the screen? Uh, those are part of the screen. I'm sorry. I think I clicked on that somehow and I don't know. Sorry, Molly. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> what else is going on for you all? Or I should ask, you know, the, the word diorama popped up and I don't want to assume that everyone's on the same page, but it, does anyone want to share um, what they associate dioramas with, where they might have seen them before, uh, or what that word brings to mind? Well, I think history. within... No, go ahead, Tim. Oh, um, I, I think within um, talking kind of about like museum spaces, like the Natural History Museum, or, you know, we see those like Paleolithic, like, you know, all those like, uh, I don't know, like cavemen and that sort of thing. There's a, there's an association, I think, with displays, with museums, with learning about things. And also, I think there's something kind of, I don't know, like, uh, I don't know, like pointing out like a primitiveness or something in a, in a way, like, oh, like, oh, like this is, something that we used to be like, or that we used to have in a way, kind of point of that contrast, which I think kind of pairs with this Bob Ross-y sort of background, I think. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And a lot of people are adding that in the chat too, right? That this is uh, reminiscent of elementary school projects or uh, natural history museums. And um, there might be uh, cavemen, I know dinosaurs are frequent, diorama subjects um, and Native Americans are the, those are sort of the three big ones that you're likely to encounter in a natural history museum. This is Chris Hanshu. I also see a lot of green leaves on the ground and usually you see discolored, like, you know, fall colored leaves on the ground when they're on the ground. So I, I don't know what that signifies at all, but I see a lot of very, healthy looking leaves on the ground, so. Yeah, another sort of strange moment of time, right? That the, the healthy green leaves have fallen. Um, there are some red leaves in the background. She's titled this one, um, so she's done one for each of the four seasons. This is Indian summer. And so I'm wondering, what does that phrase bring up for people? Or why do you think she chose that? I personally, I think of 
a song by um, a group called Odessa. They have a song called Indian Summer. Um, it's a beautiful song. Um, I This doesn't remind me of India <laughs> at all. Um, this reminds me of the sort of Native American landscape that some people associate with Indian, which I guess what I've learned is not correct, that you shouldn't refer to, you know, the, 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 the Native American people or the landscape as this Indian landscape, I think that's, or, or Indian people, I think that's been established as not desirable. Um, so, but I think of a song when I hear that, t that term, that name, that, that phrase, um, it doesn't make me think of what I'm seeing right here though. So mm -hmm. that's my two cents. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I think you're, you're pointing to a couple of important things, the sort of question of language and indigenous cultures being so important and so um, fluid or contested, uh, as well as the same, that, that question again, what is this title doing with this piece? And so other, other reactions, other thoughts? Well, I think the the term Indian summer, if I'm remembering correctly, often refers to like a a period of extended warmth kind of in what we think of as fall. Um, and so kind of a a moment of kind of time out of joint. Um, we're expecting one season and we're getting another one, um, which to me kind of makes sense. In, in a like literal um, season way that we're seeing all these like strange seasons kind of meshing together in a way that like doesn't make real sense in the natural world, but also this question of like contemporary versus historic time out of joint um, when we think about um, native peoples being something of the past instead of um, people who still live here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks Molly. I think that's a big thing of what Wendy is pointing to in this series, the way that dioramas have functioned to like contribute to that misunderstanding of native peoples as um, part of the past only, right? And uh, not an, an evolving, vibrant, contemporary group of people with diverse cultural backgrounds. Um, and so she's, she's in a way poking fun of the diorama and the way that you would walk to a museum and, and you have the, like we've talked about already, right? The native person right next to the dinosaur and the way that that is a very damaging juxtaposition. Um, a lot of people are pointing out in the chat that uh, things feel very carefully placed and arranged with purpose, um, like the butterfly on the back of the deer, um, even Wendy's clothing, right? That this, she's, this isn't your everyday outfit, that this is something um, carefully constructed. And I'm wondering if other people have thoughts about why she might be doing it in that way. Well, and it's carefully placed, but like obviously not carefully placed because of everything that we've been talking about, like the springtime flowers when the autumn is in the background. And so it's a weird like juxtaposition of like perfectly carefully placed so that it looks great, but also has like misunderstanding and clearly what's not thought about in some deeper ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. So thinking about what's intentional and what is sort of superficial or uh, taken um, to create a misunderstanding. Yeah, go ahead, Lee. Kind of similarly, I think the fact that she's like so meticulously posed um, like really highlights the fact that she's not doing anything. If she were performing an everyday task, then we would maybe have more clues about like when in time this moment is. And I feel like the the precision of her not doing anything and simply posing and like gazing into the yonder really reiterates this like n no particular moment in time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, what do other people make of like her figure in particular? We've spent a lot of time in the background and the sort of the diorama construct, um, but she's, she's placed her own body. I don't think I mentioned that yet, that that is Wendy Redstar. Um, and she's wearing a traditional obsolica elk tooth dress, um, which has a lot of cultural and personal um, value to her. And so what are, what are people make of her, her choice to put herself in this scene and put herself in such a still posture like Lee's pointing out? Can I say something, even though I know about this work? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I just can't help myself. Um, I, I also think it's hard. Well, you have to imagine this in the context of, in the exhibition, because there's photographs from 1873 of uh, Crow women wearing the exact same outfit in black and white. Yeah, images. And so that portraiture juxtaposed with this portraiture makes what you're trying to go at a, a really clear uh, statement because she is uh, intentional in this image of positioning herself like this, yeah. whereas they didn't really have a choice in the uh, earlier works. I think this like question of like where the um, where she's staring at is interesting. I think like because we're staring at her, but she's staring off into like a corner, um, and she's kind of she's present in front of this like '70s facade, which kind of also sort of brings her closer to us in a way for us to look at her more closely. So it feels I don't know at least for me like very. Um, spectatorial in a way like the way that we're looking at her and there's not sort of a like a gaze coming back at us from her um kind of in a i don't know it reminds me of kind of like a painting in that way so mm -hmm. yeah it's very like statuesque it, it like it reinforces the fact that it looks kind of like a diorama display you know the way that she's so carefully positioned it seems really passive too, like if she's passive. chosen to not like assert herself. Oh, sorry, Sarah, if you were finishing. Sierra, were you all done? I think you cut out for a second. Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was, I was done. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah similar. No, go uh, ahead. Similarly, I was just gonna say that, you know, um, I think that it's this kind of savvy take on the, history of representation of Native Americans in this country where they were either seen as as savage you know violent savages or this kind of earth spirit kind of thing and so it, it does seem that you know the words passive and things really um, I think are very key to this you know that it's non-threatening it's kind of sanitized and and whitewashed you know presented for um, an, an, a non-native audience in a way, but like to help think through some of those pre preconceptions and things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thinking about, I think that's a really important point that you brought up, like what are we all bringing to it as non-native people, or, or I don't want to assume that everybody in the audience is not, is a, not a native person. Um, and is she, what is she trying to communicate to people and um, the sort of role of the gaze in that, right? That she's playing with the idea of traditional museum dioramas usually created without native input um, or maybe updated these days in contemporary museum practice with consultation, co consultation from native representatives. Um, but here, you know, she's, she's making that choice to position herself in this way, but still sort of as, somebody being looked at. And Lee, yeah, Lee wasn't sure if it was a mannequin at first. She's so still. One thing um, that this piece, that, that her outfit um, raises for me is, is a sense of my own ignorance too, of 
in the backdrop and around her, I can very easily identify the like the fakes, if you will. But in terms of um, her outfit, it makes me think about I have no idea if you know without the context that you gave that this is an accurate traditional elk tooth dress mm -hmm. um, from the Crow Nation. And so that you know coming to it, I'm realizing like I don't actually know what the Crow um, you know traditional dress looks like and um, and so kind of a reflection on, on that self-ignorance too. Mm -hmm. Well and the context of like everything else that I do know being inaccurate makes me then question whether her outfit is accurate or whether it's like meant to be worn at a certain time that she's not at right now like clearly it's a like as you were saying it's a special occasion dress and she's not doing anything special so like what is the uh, you know I, I'm not getting any information from it because I don't trust it because everything else I'm supposed to know like isn't accurate but. Mm -hmm. yeah it's sort of making us aware of what we don't know and then making us sort of question what we think we know also yeah it also contributes to the inaccuracy of representations that museums have done. So they're going to place the, you know, a, a lot of times these dioramas would be wearing items that would be for special occasion or have on display things that shouldn't be viewed by certain people, um, like the false face masks or having um, pipes that are the stem and the bowl are, are together and in many uh, native cultures, that means that you're still on the phone with the gods above. So display inaccuracies, collecting practices. Um, she's calling all, all of that into question in, in this uh, large photograph. To speak what Laura is saying, um, Wendy talks about dioramas as kind of these like fantasies that we want to believe. Um, and to also comment on something that someone said earlier, I forget who, um, the fact that this is sort of whitewashed. This is for an audience who's white to see. And um, that again speaks to this fantasy, like this is kind of represents all of our misconceptions. And um, like Molly was saying, we don't know, you know, what is real and what is fake. Yeah, we have just a few more minutes before we break into um, breakout rooms, about five minutes. But I wanted to, to build off of that, which Lily just shared, that one of the things that Wendy talks about is sort of the process behind this work, where she was in grad school in LA, and it was one of her, the first times where she was not living on the reservation, her first time away from home, um, and she was feeling really homesick. And she said her first reaction, she was like, where can I go to see some Crow culture, Crow people? And she thought, okay, I know, I'll go to the Natural History Museum. And then she had this sort of moment of like, how messed up is that, that that's my first reaction? But that's where she went and she was able to go and see just one crow moccasin and have that be like a, a way of connecting to home. Um, and she says she'll go to other dioramas of crow people and feel like, yeah, that, you know, that's what home looks like. Um, and one of the most common questions that I've gotten since this exhibition has opened um, in July is, what mountains are those? <laughs> and, um, you know, so I put that to Wendy and she said she gets asked that question all the time and people are always projecting different mountains. And she has no idea because she just got it from, you know, eBay or whatever, but um, that people will say, I, I swear to God, it's the Grand Tetons or I swear to God, it's this mountain in uh, Canada. Um, and so I think that speaks to the fantasy, right? That like we, we bring things to dioramas, to images that we're projecting onto it based on what we have seen before. I think also in like, in conjunction with that, I think um, like when I see a like a diorama, I think I oftentimes want like a textual part to that as well. Like I want there to be like wall mountings that say, oh, and this is this thing, this is this thing with like the different, you know, with like the different areas pointed out and like how in sort of to contrast it with some of her other work that has like text writing over like photographs. I think this one also is, I don't know, it just seems to like kind of be, I don't know, like that sort of like questioning that uncertainty. I think it, it I don't know, it seems sort of like successful or maybe it was like part of it to have this sort of sense of, oh, I don't know what that is. I'm kind of, I'm confused and um, 
yeah, which I think is not oftentimes a space that you experience when you're looking at a diorama. Mm -hmm. And I think that speaks to a big difference between a traditional diorama, which people said at the beginning is meant to teach, right? And you're meant to learn something. There's those texts nearby and um, a work of art, which is meant to teach some things, but is also meant to question. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think the teaching aspect also like uh, talking about like people wanting to know the mount, you know, what, which mountains are these, there's sort of this temptation to like substitute a few facts, like whether this is an authentic piece of dress or not, um, for like really knowing the cultural context or the, the people. It's sort of just placing a, a few simple facts on top of something that's not really known or understood. So almost like a you know, I, I'm so overwhelmed by what I don't know. I need to latch on to something easy to know. And that, that, I think that's kind of what yeah. the what the sort of diorama really lends itself to is sort of a, mm. a, a very superficial kind of uh, set of facts or supposed facts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Any? Yeah. Ahead, Chris. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think um, Lisa Anderson said, like, aren't aren't there faint dreamlike images on the left and right edges and I, I it looks like as if it's like this photograph um it's also i don't know in some ways very psychedelic in a way like it's like there's a lot that that's there and that's presented to you that you can't necessarily tell for sure is like reality or not and i guess that's something that strikes me is that it's like this like well what what am i really seeing here and and, and what's what's false what's real um that's something that i noticed yeah thank you all right so maybe this is a good natural point um So yeah, and then Laura leaves us, what if this is an actual diorama, not a photo? Because the work itself is 2D, but you can sort of imagine if it were 3D. Um, but so we're gonna break into breakout groups and continue the conversation um, with someone from education and someone from the Artist Impact Coalition sort of shepherding the conversations. And then we'll come back and share out and then um, have a couple of announcements before we wrap up. Okay, so thanks everyone. I know we were um, almost cut off mid-word, but um, I enjoyed my conversation. I hope you all enjoyed your breakout room conversations too. And I wanna just invite um, the representatives to sort of share out. So I think we had four groups. Um, Laura, do you wanna start to share some of the things that your group was talking about or someone from your group wanna step up? Sure, does anybody wanna talk and step in me? Amanda, you wanna do it? Um, well, sure, I mean, we had a, I talked about a variety of different things. Um, I mean, Erica had a lot of great information and to share just kind of a little bit more about the, the kind of the specific, um, histories in the of, in North Adams and, and, and things and, and just kind of the importance of that. Um, there was some talk about um, this is as a, a an opportunity to grow and, and learn and, and kind of correct the misinformation and misconceptions that so many of us were were taught um, in our um, in our own education um, and not continue passing those things along. Um, and yeah, I feel like I'm forgetting things, but uh, that's that's what I remember. <laughs> so if anyone else from the group wants to jump in, but it was it was very it was it was great. Cool, thank you. Yeah, not to put anyone on the spot, just share a couple highlights. Um, Lily and Blair, does your group want to go? Yeah, I was gonna go for our group. Okay. Um, so one thing that kind of came up was the importance of slowing down, both like in education and then also like when looking at art, like it's really important for kids who are like 
and how impactful it can be when we don't. Like if children are on a tour going through a museum and there's a disinterested tour guide at a historical museum, like, oh, and this is like, these are the Native Americans, these are the Indians, like that sums it all up. And like how much there is behind everything that you may not be able to um, learn or absorb and how this conversation is really beneficial and able to get us beyond just the like wow factor because the image is really beautiful and can like I just kind of want to be like oh it's so pretty like look at the colors but it's been so wonderful to have this opportunity to slow down and dig in and get beyond um, our initial uh, how we see it and something Lily said was that um, whilst being working in kids space she's been pleasantly surprised by like how many people are doing that and are slowing down and are like coming to that um, understanding of kind of the unquieted um, part of that image um, and then in terms of thinking about what we've learned about indigenous cultures like a lot of people brought up like how um, we more a lot of us have re more recently learned like the immense diversity that th is present um, in indigenous cultures all over the world and in America um, and let's see what else was there Oh, one thing that was interesting was like, uh, that came up recently was someone had been part of a panel discussion where people had brought up like problematic language and not just like, I found my tribe or like powwow. And then it was also talked about like the Pioneer Valley is something that all of us kind of use and refer to and how that also can be problematic or is problematic. Um, I don't know if there was more beyond that, but yeah. Yeah, spirit animal is one in that category, right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Levy and Molly, someone from your group want to go? We didn't assign anyone. Does anyone want to share what we discussed? I did too much talking. So Levy, do you want to, uh, can I put you on the spot for summarizing? I thought, I thought we had some really fascinating conversations and I appreciated all your contributions, Molly. I, um, just to echo that, like, uh, people want to know more. Um, our group had a lot of people who sort of had recently moved to Western Massachusetts and right, are encountering things like the Mohawk Trail. And it's like, why, why that name? What's the history? Um, and I think that, you know, the, the other interesting thing is that there are other members of our group who had done a lot of amazing research and were here to sort of share what they read and learned. Um, and um, yeah, I hope that sort of after this event, uh, there'll be a space for us to sort of share all of our resources together. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Molly, is there anything you want to add? No, that was great. All right. Thank you. And then the last group is the one that Becky and I were in. And so uh, does anyone from our group want to share out? Becky, can I put you on the spot? Yeah, yeah. I was like scrolling through to see if anyone <laughs> like. <laughs> um, yeah, our group talked uh, a lot about really similar things to the other groups, um, really just questioning what we know or what we don't know. And when we approached the question of what misconceptions were on learning, it was just such an overwhelming question because there's so many things that we don't know. And so all the things that we have learned from school or misrepresentational media just seemed so inaccurate that all of a sudden we realized there's so much that we don't know um, and a lot of very limited resources for learning more and we're all very a little unsettled by how intentional that is and how um, a lot of things have been erased for for a reason and feeling a little uh, we don't really have much control over what we could learn, um, which was just a really interesting thing for us all to, to come to terms with. And then uh, questions about the local indigenous cultures. Um, we just talked a little bit about always hearing the Mohicans were here and that's the, the phrase and the terms that we hear most often, but there's probably a longer chronological history that we aren't as aware of and questioning how we prioritize recently here but that's not the whole history there's probably even more before that that we aren't aware of so i hope that summed everything up did i miss anything people from my group you nailed it cool cool 
Well, thank you all so much. We have a few more things. Um, I'm going to ask Lily to introduce the art project and then um, we'll have a couple of announcements. And while I'm going to ask uh, Levy and Erica Barreto to share announcements um, specifically, you know, vocally. But if other people have things that are going on that you think would be of interest to this group, please add them to the chat. And then um, I'll follow up with more resources and um, things like that in an email uh, in the coming week or so. Um, so Lily, over to you. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so we're gonna share a downloadable art project based on a series of family portrait quilts that Wendy makes, where she adds photos of her own family into the design of the quilt. Um, so we're gonna share a PDF that, in the chat that has an image of one of the quilts with Wendy's photos removed. So you can add your own family photos either by drawing or um, gluing in some of your own family photographs. Thank you. And I'm just looking, trying to figure out how to upload the, um, the blue background one to the chat. And I'll work on that while people are um, doing their announcements. But I also want to say we're, we want to encourage you to share on social media what you make. Um, and um, just use, and I'll put this in the follow-up email, but use um, the KidSpace hashtag, hashtag KidSpaceMM. Um, and if we come up with another catchier Artist Impact Coalition one, in the meantime, we will send that along. Uh, but just to sort of share out the way you've been engaging with this work beyond tonight. Um, so look for those details. And um, then Levy, do you wanna go first since it's Wendy specific? Yeah, I'd love to. So hi, everyone. My name is Levy. Uh, I'm an education fellow this year at MassMoca, and I'm a co-director of this new project called Care Syllabus. It's an initiative between MassMoca and MCLA that between late 2020 and 21 highlights six different expert takes on strategies of justice-oriented care uh, using the perspectives of artists, of academics, and of activists. Um, this project, Care Syllabus, is hosted at caresyllabus.org, and uh, each of its six modules consists of published multimedia content as well as live events. Um, just very briefly, the project has three main objectives. First, uh, it promotes inquiry into what care looks and feels like into different parts of our lives right now. Second, it puts all the different balances of care um, at the front and center of conversations about building a more just world uh, in the face of this ongoing pandemic. And lastly, um, it's a collaborative programming initiative that tries to strengthen partnerships between cultural organizations and higher ed in the area by using care as an organizing principle. And so Wendy Redstar is actually the first of our six uh, guest curators. And her module, which launches on December 7th, is called Reconnecting Objects with Their Homes. And it's really a deep dive into the different strategies that she uses in her art to care for the indigenous life and culture that she uncovers in museum collections. Uh, Wendy's module features a lot of great content. There are going to be personal reflections on her research processes, behind the scenes look at the making of her Mass Mocha exhibition and her printmaking practice, uh, episodes from her favorite podcasts about care, as well as a lot of wonderful interviews about art and care. Um, and so, like I said, this material will go live on December 7th, but the real kickoff uh, of the module is actually December 15th, when Wendy's gonna be hosting a live virtual roundtable with a collection specialist at the National Museum of the American Indian, as well as two other artists, uh, Tanis Selton and Peter Morin. And this discussion is gonna focus on the ways that indigenous artists are engaging the National Museum of the American Indian's collection in order to transform the museum's goals and practices around collection care. Um, so if you have been interested in you know, learning about Wendy's practice tonight, I hope that you will join us on the 15th and check out Care Syllabus. I just posted in the chat a link uh, to register for that event. Um, yeah, and thanks so much. Thank you, Levy. Erica, do you want to share about WAM's event this weekend? Yeah, so I'm going to pop it in the chat. WAM Theater, um, it starting tonight at 7.30 through Sunday, November 22nd, um, is producing um, the Thanksgiving play, which is a fast paced satire directed by Larissa Fast Horse from the Lakota Nation. And it talks about where good intentions collide with these absurd assumptions. Um, I also wanna pop in a little mini trailer in case you're interested, tickets. Um, but it's this troupe of uh, white liberal teaching artists, a scramble to devise grade school theater performance that 
manages to celebrate Turkey Day while also honoring Native American heritage. It's a really great use of laugh, uh, comedy satire to discuss these difficult conversations. Um, and in the same vein, we had a panel discussion with Talia Kingston from WAMP Theater and Heather Bruegel from the Stockbridge Muncie community, moderated by Destiny Rivera, uh, where we kind of unpack some of the themes and uh, discuss action steps for institutions in the area. And so a recording of that will be made available here soon. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge um, that Yes, Berkshire County is on Mohican land, but North Adams specifically, after working with Heather Bruegel, is on Wabanaki Confederacy land. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that um, they're known as the people of the Don land um, and the tribes of the Wakanabe Confederacy were indigenous to the lands of contemporary Maine, Vermont, Northwestern Massachusetts. Um, and so I just wanted to honor their indigeneity to this land and commit to acknowledging um, their founding in this community. So, thanks. Thank you, Erica. I think that drives home how much I have to learn, how much we all have to learn to uh, keep going. So many, many thanks to all of you, to the Artist Impact Coalition members, to Matt Smoka staff members, friends from near and far um, who've joined us tonight. And um, I hope that we'll see you at the next session. Thanks, everybody. So long. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.